and those that are watching on the live stream. It's good to have you all with us today. Let's stand together. And let's sing with a whole heart to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's stand again.
the power over the grave and he rose 2,000 years ago and that's why we gather together today in worship. Well, welcome. My name is Tim Mascara. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Stonebridge. And again, really glad that you're worshiping with us here this morning, whether in person or through online. On the way in uh, or online, you can find out what's going on in the life of the church through this little info card that you should have gotten on the way in. There's a little QR code there that you can scan. Uh, Let us know that you're here. You can give online through texting or uh, set it and forget it or on the boxes on the way out, as well as fill Fill out prayer requests. We talk a lot about prayer requests and the power of prayer, and I know I personally enjoy praying for the requests that come through the church, and I know there are many within this family that love it also and look forward to praying for the needs of the church. So we encourage you, if there's something on your heart that you are asking the church to pray for or the leadership to pray for, take a moment, fill that out so we can pray for it. And then if you've seen the Lord move, if you've seen him answer one of your prayer requests, Put it in there too, so that we can celebrate together as a family. A couple announcements for you this morning. First, next week, we begin a new GROW class on covenants called the Through Line. Uh, GROW is our adult discipleship class that meets uh, at 1030 on Sunday mornings. So everybody in here, you can't make it today, but next week you could make it when the new class kicks off. There we go. So every Sunday at 10.30 upstairs, we have classes for adults and students on the other side and children's ministry as well, as we not only long to worship him through song and word, but to then grow in our discipleship and following him. And so the next class that kicks off again is Covenants. The Bible is a big book. There's a lot in there, and we see that the framework of covenants helps us better understand how God uh, works with and for people. 
And so they'll be delving into that. The other announcement is our Life Bridge ministry would like to invite you to join them for prayer after this service out by the waterfall. You probably all passed it on the way in, whether you realize it was a waterfall or not. There's a little stone bridge there. And um, if, you, uh, if the Lord has laid on your heart praying for men and women as they face unplanned pregnancies, please join our brothers and sisters out there that, that pray for that. Now, as we go into the worship service this morning, we're going to kick off with an old hymn. It was written in 1770 by William Cowper. There is a fountain. And he was reading in Zechariah, and there was one verse that just caused this hymn to, to burst forth. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, it says, On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the, and, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Zechariah was writing about that day when Christ would give his life. And as he spilled his blood, a fountain of living water was opened. And that's what we're going to sing. So please stand and join with me as I pray in preparing us for worship. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can call you Father, that we can come before your throne. We know it's not because of anything that we bring. Lord, I, I am even the best that I could bring or be is not enough. So I rely upon Christ, and we rely upon Christ today. And Lord, so we long to see the day when our faith will be made sight, when this poor, lisping, stammering voice will join in a song that has echoed for ages. In your name we pray, amen.
You said Satan fall like lightning. You made darkness run for cover. But what your grace has done is what I can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe that you've done wonders. I have resurrection power. Still your grace alone is what I can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story, I testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony blood and washed in water sing the praises of a spirit son and father our god will finish what he started yes our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life as grace rewrote my story i testify by jesus christ the righteous I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony. From death to life, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, but Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, this is my testimony, oh I believe, this is my testimony, from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, but Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what I see.
done great things. He's set captives free. He's conquered the grave. And we believe he's not done yet, right? We, the church, you get to partner with him to play a role. And so uh, we wanted to take a moment. We've, we've asked for stories of, of how you've been involved with neighbors and, and, and loving on neighbors. And, and we've collected some true stories. And we wanted to share a few of them with you now. What would it look like if a church went beyond the walls of a building? What would it look like if there was a stone bridge in every neighborhood in the area? We are the church when we do things like this. Worshiping on Sunday morning in the driveway with neighbors during the COVID lockdown. Comforting an elderly neighbor as he watches his house burn to the ground. Seeing water pouring from a neighbor's house and helping him with the plumbing repairs. Inviting a neighbor and her daughter over for dinners while her husband is deployed. This is what giving ourselves away looks like. This is what it looks like to be a bridge of grace for God's glory. Thank you for sharing your stories. And we ask that if, if there are more stories to share, share them with us. Because again, Stonebridge is not just about these four walls. It's about all of God's people, you, me, living out into the community, the love of Christ. Just as the way that Jesus offered, asked for a drink from the Samaritan woman, there was a bridge to a conversation to offer the living water. We have the opportunity to do the same for the people around us. We're going to take a moment and pray, and we'll pray for our tithes and our offerings also, but we'll, we'll pray for continued uh, partnership with God and the work that we get to be called to join in. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are not done yet. We thank you that you have rescued us, and you have put a joy in us to go and share that with others. I pray, Lord, that as we, uh, as we go from this place, as we think about what you have for Stonebridge next, we will be moved to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Father, as we give you our tithes and our offerings, we pray that you would use them to further your name. Lord, we often pray it's not about Stonebridge, but it's about you. And Lord, we give you our tithes and our offerings as an act of gratitude, an act of thanks, an act of worship to say thank you for how much you have blessed us, how much you have provided for us, even more in the work of Jesus. And so we pray, Lord, that you would multiply the resources that come into Stonebridge to further your name throughout these communities, throughout the, the world around us as we partner with so many ministries looking to point people to you. To, uh, I think about where we're going today in, in the passage. Lord, the harvest is plentiful. And so may we see that and may we long and live that out. In your name we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 27 to 42. Hear the word of the Lord. 
Just then, his disciples had returned and were surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this man is really the savior of the world. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's start with prayer. Father, today as we come into your presence through your word, we ask that even as you met the Samaritan woman at the well, you would meet us. And as you did with her, you would use your word to reveal to us our hurts and our sorrows, our shame and our guilt, so that we may experience your forgiveness, your healing, your love, and your purpose. Open our hearts and minds to receive it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Today, as we approach the next section in John, we pick, up, uh, we pick up a story Tim began last week, the story of the Samaritan woman. As he pointed out, this story isn't necessarily shocking or awe-inspiring to us today due to our cultural context. But in, our, but in their time, it would have been entirely scandalous. And one of the batches, and literally batches of reasons for this, was a slew of socio-cultural precedents which made it entirely inappropriate for Jesus to reach out to any woman and especially... To, this, to a Samaritan woman. But as we saw, with tact and providence, as Jesus had done many times before, he brushed aside those societal barriers like brushing aside old dead cobwebs on cleaning day so that he could reach her. This is something the church has allowed, has followed Jesus' example in throughout history, with one of the most famous examples being in Antioch where Rome had separated ethnic groups by building walls around their particular areas. The Christians, for the sake of the gospel, tore down parts of those walls so that brothers and sisters in Christ from different ethnic backgrounds would not be separated, but would actually be in unity with each other and be able to share that life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ with the whole world all done as they followed Christ's example as said in this passage and in numerous other places throughout Scripture. Today, however, we're not going to focus on the breaking of those particular cultural norms. Tim did a phenomenal job with that last week. Instead, in order to better understand the transformation that the Samaritan woman experienced and everything else that happens in this passage, we're going to start by focusing on the barrier maker, the thing that ultimately causes the concept of scandal, sin itself. So to summarize, and starting where Jesus did, once he got to content with the woman, the sin of the Samaritan woman was adultery. 
So adultery, of course, is a church word. What does that mean? Acknowledging every member of our congregation, uh, from oldest to youngest, who's present right now, let me say that most people think of this word the wrong way. In Matthew 5.28, Jesus actually says that anyone that that means man or woman, married or single, can commit adultery. So in this area, if you're doing anything that you should only be doing with your husband or wife, or pursuing that thought life, which is also not centered on your husband or wife, we're committing adultery. And that's where the woman was. Jesus, in one of his prophetic moments, reveals that the woman had what he describes as five husbands and is currently with a sixth man who isn't her husband. True, we don't know the circumstances of the marriages, and it would have been very unlikely she was the initiator of all of the divorces, maybe any of them given the historical period and the context. But we do know for a fact that in this passage, she is living with someone she's not married to and thus in adultery. So theologically, she's in unrepentant sin. And from a theological perspective, there are several implications. First, sin creates a barrier by separating us from God. We could spend an entire grow class on the whys and wherefores upstairs at 1030 on any given Sunday in rooms 206 and the cafe. Come to think of it, if you're not volunteering with children's ministry or the youth group, I invite all of you to attend 9 o'clock service so you can join us and grow. But um, let me find my place. (laughs) But the end result... Of that first uh, of sin, the first effect we look at is separation from God. And that opens us up to suffering the second and third effects of sin. The second, and again with the long list of whys that we could explore somewhere, um, due to that same self-seeking issue, um, because sin fundamentally is about us wanting our own thing, right? Sin naturally creates barriers between ourselves and others. So sometimes we say that sin necessarily undermines our vertical relationship with God, and it also necessarily undermines our horizontal relationships with other people, thus bringing the effects of sin, barriers, stigma, things like that into society. But it also has a third very important effect. It wedges barriers inside of us, destroying our relationship with ourselves. And this is where we'll camp with the Samaritan woman for a moment. Because sin, other people's sin, as well as her own, was tearing her apart. So put yourself in the shoes of the woman. You're her, freshly married, first husband, no idea of what the future holds. You believe you found a life mate. You believe you found someone who's going to love you, accept you, be a rock for and with you. In this culture, someone to protect you, provide for you, care for you when you're sick, start a family with you. And then, as probably happened, in spite of all that, he divorces you. What lies would you be tempted to believe about yourself? About your worth? About your value before God and man? Now, I have to step aside for a moment, and I want to acknowledge that some of you in this room don't have to imagine this circumstance. You've been through it, and I'm sorry. You've probably asked yourself these very questions and been tempted to believe the very same lies that she was tempted to believe 2,000 years ago. But let me say, the same things that we're going to discover to be true for her, as she came to Christ with all of the messy details of her life on display, both those she was responsible for and those she wasn't responsible for those same things are true for you. 
and hold on because we're going to get there, but we need to go deeper into this woman's experience first so none of us can have any doubts about the reality of that goodness. So let's step back into the experience in Jacob's well in Samaria. Each of us was putting ourselves in the shoes of the Samaritan woman. She'd experienced the joy of marriage, the hope of it, the fulfillment of a dream. And then the dream became a nightmare. Imagine the doubts and self recriminations. Imagine the questions. What could I have done differently? How could I have been better? What could I have done to make him stick around? And then a second chance presents itself. A second husband, a second divorce. Where would your internal monologue go? It couldn't be chance, you might say. It couldn't be an accident, you might be tempted to hear. What questions would you be asking? Am I fundamentally flawed? Am I a broken human being? Does God hate me? Then a third marriage and a third divorce. Maybe a death, we don't know, but at this point, would it really matter? And now forget about the thoughts and self-questioning. What would you be feeling? Dejected? Hopeless? Angry? Like a black hole of misery in the center of a bright universe? Would you be resentful of everybody else's happiness, feeling like you were destined for nothing but pain? And don't forget about the effects of stigma. Social shunning has probably become tangible by this point. Friends are peeling away. Glances in the street have probably turned to glares. The external reality and the internal fears seem to coalesce in her experience and come together to merge one seemingly undeniable truth about the value of who she is. But you get another chance. A fourth marriage and then a fourth divorce. And a fifth marriage? Well, after that, maybe just forget about marriage. I expect she just didn't want to be alone. What would that woman be yearning for by the time Jesus met her? Would she even know? Or is she bought in slowly to the lies of sin and began to unwittingly pursue them? Would she have discarded her God-given and good desires as fantasy and bought into a hopeless, realistic, pragmatic reality of disappointment and death? This is maybe an extreme example, but this is where the third effect of sin will take us. It steals our hope and steals our faith. It robs us of love and causes us to cease to see ourselves as those who've been made in the image of God. It leaves us living living on the outside but dead on the inside. And as such, life is nothing but a living death. Now, as low as the Samaritan woman has gone, we need to ask a question to finish this journey. That question is, what would the opposite be like? If you went the same distance that you went into the depths, but instead went to the heights, where would that put you? Friends, as dark and as dismal as her life had become, how bright and exuberant would the opposite be? As desolate as her waste was, how rich in exaltation would the opposite be? As scorned and lonely as she was, how admired and desired and fulfilled would the opposite be? Because when Jesus showed up at that well and gave her living water, everything changed. Death itself turned to life. And we see it in this morning's passage. Did you catch it when Anand read the text earlier? As the disciples show up, the Samaritan woman's no longer trudging with water pots in the heat of the day. She's returning to the town. She's crying out, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Guys, 
Those words, everything I ever did, that's the source of her shame, the source of her death. Now it's as if she were waving what had previously been credentials of death and shame, waving it as a flag of hope and faith, dancing in the streets, saying, he knows it all, everything about me. It's the Messiah, and I don't have to be afraid. I had lost faith. My heart was dead, but he gave me life, living water. You don't ever have to be afraid. <coughs> Shame and scorn are no more. Fear and doubts are in the past. It's the Messiah. In him, true fulfillment comes. We don't have to be afraid. With the woman in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4, the Samaritan woman had realized that God saw in her all her scarred, flawed, ragged detail, and that he had responded to her with love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace, that he saw nothing in her as lacking and everything wonderful. Do you realize can you feel that if you're in Christ, if you're one of his followers, he responds to you that same way? With love, acceptance, joy, and more. If you're a Christ follower, a disciple, then God rejoices in you as he rejoices in Christ. You see, Christ didn't come to save us in spite of our sin and all its various replications. There, there is a sense in which that's true. But the better description is that he came to save us because of our sin and all of its various repercussions. Now, if that idea is new to you, the because of, as opposed to the in spite of, don't worry, the disciples hadn't fully absorbed it yet either. So you're in good company. So now we're going to join them as Jesus gets to the heart of this passage. To set the scene, as the disciples returned from getting lunch, the woman was excitedly heading to town. They saw her, but weren't quite sure what to do about her, which is the in verse 27, no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her um, statement. They would have probably known she was a Samaritan woman by the way she was dressed. And of course, they could see her excitement and exuberance, but that was pretty normal around Jesus. Um, so probably due to cultural boundaries, um, they didn't ask what had happened. So this is how the story continues from there. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So the discussion moves from the water of life to the food of God's will and work. First off, this passage isn't saying anything about how much a person should or shouldn't eat or how often. Let's, that's not it. So, what is going on here? We spent a lot of time on the transformation of the Samaritan woman because her restoration to her turning into a gospel witness, from her restoration to her turning into a gospel witness, she typifies what Jesus came to accomplish in all of our lives. We can call that the what right? But here, as Jesus moves from discussing the water of life to the food of the will and work of God, we begin to understand and see that Jesus is marrying the why to the what. Because Jesus knew his followers, all of us, need to have that deeper level of understanding. So let's pause and ask, why? What does it mean that the food, that his food is to do the will of him who sent him and finish his work. Some in the room may jump immediately to the theological answer. He gains pleasure from living for the glory of God. That is an absolutely correct theological answer, and it includes everything we're about to look at. 
But this passage is very specific about caring for somebody in her suffering. And though some of us are wired weirdly, for most of us, the whole concept of the glory of God isn't quite as encouraging. It's not a great way to experience God personally. So let's be more specific. More people in the room probably jumped to his finding joy in living out love as an answer. This is good. This is also true. It fits within glory and goes to where we're headed. But again, love is a vague word, right? <clears throat> there are very many specific applications of love, but it's a big, vague word. So how can we get more specific and at the same time communicate this concept? As I read through the commentators and saw all of them saying basically the same thing, but in very different ways, interestingly, we can probably summarize it all by saying, rescue and restore. Jesus came to rescue and to restore. A good example of this is in Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 15 and 16. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays, rescue. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, restore. In Luke chapter 19, we see it this way. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, to rescue the lost and to restore them. We have a great graphic example in Isaiah 58 demonstrating the heart of God that lay behind this. He's speaking of an acceptable fast, but this shows his heart. Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. The will and work of God that Jesus found delight in accomplishing was in seeing lives restored and transformed through the spread of the gospel because he knew that sin was the ultimate root problem for all humanity. So why was it so important? that the disciples understand this. Let's look back at the text. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for the harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So in this text, Jesus says that his joy his delight, the thing that feeds and sustains his soul is doing the work of rescuing and restoring people from the enslaving power of sin. And then he gives this harvest statement, which is the third reference to physical sustenance in this passage. Water, food, grain. Catch the, catch the progression? Here's the point, because there have been lots of pages written about this in commentaries. Most people saying we don't have a clue. Um, but here's what Jesus is getting at by referencing things that we need for our sustenance. Jesus is effectively telling his disciples to stop being obsessed with the distractions of this world, even necessary and good ones. He's come to rescue and restore them so that they can then go out and rescue and restore others by bridging them to him. If they ever want to be like him, they need to have his same passion to rescue and restore. If you want to be like Jesus, you have to pursue his passions. Look at the back half of verse 35. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for the harvest. This isn't an academic observation or even an invitation. It's actually a command. 
If we, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Paul puts it this way. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. I know that in, out of its fuller context, the first half of that verse is a bit confusing, but notice twice the ministry of reconciliation has been passed on from Christ to his followers. Now Christ accomplished the reconciliation, right? But we bring people to him. And that's that final phrase, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Much as the Christians in Antioch that, that we began the sermon with, the ones who physically tore down walls for the sake of the gospel, we, all those of us who are in Christ, have been appointed as ambassadors who freely offer the gospel so that the barriers erected by sin, barriers between humanity and God, barriers between people and people, the barriers between individuals and their own hearts can be torn down and true eternal restoration can occur. It's a great privilege, a great gift. So why is it that most of us don't actively live as ambassadors of Christ? What keeps us from being excited about sharing the gospel? And let me just say, if we have the Holy Spirit, we have been gifted for sharing the gospel in word and deed, both. And friends, when you see new life come into someone, when you see Christ restore someone, like the Samaritan woman, I can't describe the joy of seeing that work happen. So what keeps us from sharing? There are suffering friends who don't know Christ who could use the joy and hope. So let's just spend a few minutes looking at categories, then uh, categories of things that keep us from sharing. And then I'm going to invite you to spend a few moments in prayer with me. Because honestly, when we know that we've been given a mission, not just a mission, but a privilege by God, that we get to be bridges of grace. But we're afraid to really do that fully, to its fullest extent, usually there's something we need to come to God with and confess. So what keeps us from doing that? Why don't I share? I don't feel equipped. This was a big one for me most of my life. And honestly, um, guys, if you don't feel equipped and you've got someone you would like to share with, that's on us as a church. It's our job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So if, you've got, if you don't feel equipped, come, approach us, write an email, let me know. We'll do what we can to share with you and equip you and help you know how to share the truth that you have. And in the future, we do have more things coming down the pipeline to equip our whole congregation, like what we did with Long Story Short, to be able to share the truths of our faith and the joy that we have. I'm afraid to not have answers. You know, this is one that I had going into seminary, and amazingly, that fear was actually bigger after I came out of seminary. Very weird thing. But I'm afraid to not have answers. Um, usually, I, and there is education we can do for discussions and follow-ups, um, but oftentimes we're putting too much weight on ourselves rather than the Holy Spirit with this one. I'm afraid of a negative response. So the other day I was doing this thing. I've, I've learned this new gospel sharing strategy. I went over to my neighbor. I was thinking because we have a good deep relationship, lots of goodwill between us, I was thinking of moving in that direction with the conversation. And when it got to that crucial juncture, I looked at my neighbor. Then I looked at the flower bed and I said, those are nice flowers. Has anyone else ever had that experience when you really want to share with somebody the, the gospel you want to share with them hope or ask them questions of why they haven't pursued or explored? Um, that's a big one for me. Um, but once again, 
What are we doing? We're misprioritizing there. We're, we're seeing our own comfort rather than the joy that we have, the gift we have to impart. I don't have time or opportunities. Hey, I have two and a half year old twins, like little twin girls. So two and a half year old, I don't know if that's 12 year old really, I don't know. It's a thing with a six year old son, I understand busy and all of us have those moments in life where we are just overwhelmed and riding the wave and trying to survive. But if we know that that's a pattern in our life, if one month extends to two months, to five months, to a year, to two years, and we don't have room in our life and opportunities to share, that's probably more of a priority issue. And for me, when I look at misplaced priorities, I usually have to dig deep and find the idols that I've elevated that I need to confess. I'm struggling with my faith. Guys, if you're struggling with your faith, of course, why are you going to go out? John the Baptist, did you know that John the Baptist in jail, the guy who baptized Jesus and sent his own disciples after Jesus, sent another one of his followers when he was in jail towards the end of the life? Are you the one whom God sent or should we wait for another? John was questioning. We all go through periods where we have doubts or questions. That's all right. Email one of us pastors. Get in contact with one of the elders, somebody who's a spiritually mature and can be a mentor around you. It's not wrong to ask questions. It's actually good and helps us go deeper in our faith. I just don't want to. So, when I find myself directly in opposition to God's will, it usually takes me a while, but I have to start by confessing. Because if he's told us to do something, given us a role, and we refuse to do it, that's sin. So I spend a few, I, I confess, I spend a few moments believing the gospel, and then I pray that God would reveal to me why I'm unwilling. What else is keeping me from experiencing the blessing of owning this priority? What am I valuing that I don't see? And then I ask for a new heart. So this is what we're going to do next. We're gonna spend a time together in confession, but we're gonna do it slightly differently. You see, we've got three parts, a verbal prayer of confession, then a silent time, a prayer of assurance and a silent time, and then a prayer for new obedience and a silent time. The prayer of assurance is normally when I would actually pronounce assurance over you from scripture, we'll do that in prayer. And what's going to happen is I'm just going to say a prayer for myself, but also leading you guys, um, this is going to last 15, 20 seconds. And then I'll be quiet for 15, 20 seconds and let you bring anything that's on your heart to God. And then we'll move to the next phase and we'll do the same thing, except that second one isn't meant to be confession. We've now confessed. It's the assurance of forgiveness that we have and standing that we have with Christ. And then the last one is praying that God would give us a new heart to desire his priorities. So, if you'd like, I invite you to join me in prayer. Father, um, I come before you today confessing my own misplaced priorities. So often, I feel like the things that I'm about, the tasks that I'm about, the things I want to accomplish or the time I want to have to myself, I feel that that's more important um, than what you would call me to view, call me to love. More important than sharing love with my neighbors. On the same level, my own fear of rejection. I, I put their concern for, my concern for how they view me over my concern for whether or not they have relationship with you. And so I confess that my heart priorities aren't in line with yours. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. Now take the next few seconds if you have anything you'd like to bring to the Lord.
Father, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, you say that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. In 1 John 1, 9, you tell us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Father, thank you that I know as a fact that right now you see me with all the joy that you see Christ Jesus. That as you take pride in him and rejoice in him and love him, so you love me. And every person here who is your child, you don't see us in light of our sins. You see us in light of your love of Christ. Father, I ask that everyone in this room would experience that love, that forgiveness now. Father, I ask that you would give me, continue to give me a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, you speak of transforming hearts of stone to hearts of flesh in your new covenant and giving us hearts that mirror yours. I ask that you would give me a heart with an increasing desire to share your gospel, to share your love, your truth, that I might be a bridge of grace, that others may experience rescue, and restoration. And I pray the same for everyone here. And I'll take the next few moments. How do you want God to give you a new heart? matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we finish out, we see the end of this section where the Samaritans had come from the town. They had now come to Christ and converged, and they'd gotten a chance to know Christ. And at the end, they say to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. See, they have come in, come into life. They've been rescued. They've been restored because that woman was willing to be a bridge of grace, connecting them to the one who had saved her. How joyous of a moment would that be for you to experience being that bridge of grace. Now, as we finish up, um, we're going to go into our last song. And I just invite you to live in the reality of the new identity Christ has given you as you became his child. Thank you, Daniel. Let's stand together, church.
and receive the Lord's benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.